Falchagu Yeo Scott's The Celtic Podcast. Kimra Ha Holodunya, how is everyone? On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gallic, that's Let's Try Little Gallic. Lesson 19, The Wens. In Celtic history, it's the Highland Clearances. In everyday Celtic ways, Oum, the secret code of our ancestors. And we'll hear music from Ishbel McCaskill, Selkie Girls, Runrig, Monrin, and Cara Dillon. And as always, it's a wee bit of Irish trivia to start us off. What is the meaning of the colors of the Irish flag? What do they hold? If you're already a subscriber to the The Old Scott YouTube channel and enjoy the variety of interesting videos and podcasts that we produce weekly, then you should join us on the Ye Old Scott Facebook group. Not only do you get all the great videos you already enjoy, but so much more. Come and connect with your Celtic community here on Ye Old Scott Facebook group. Welcome to Learn a Gaelic Song. Today's song, Hick and Shmirnak Eschirak. Hick and Shmirnak Eschirak. The thrush will come in spring. A beautiful love song where the girl comments that while the birds and the trees are getting closer together in the spring, she and her love are growing further and further apart. She gives advice to other young girls not to fall for a man who is full of sweet talking because despite all he says, his heart can be as ice and he will always be looking for the prettiest face. And remember, Gallic at the top, English at the bottom. Get ready. He kiss me or a kishcharok. He kihu Speak a hian ounce Oh, 
Scottish Gaelic is native to the Gales of Scotland. Scottish Gaelic developed out of the Old Irish, and learning this beautiful language can be a direct link to your Gaelic ancestors. Follow along in Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, and like I said, let's try a little Gaelic. Falchagu ye old Scots, the beginner's Gaelic course. Kimraha Huladunya, how is everyone? Looky there, you already know how to say welcome to and how is everyone. All right, in the next 25 lessons um, of Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, that's Let's Try a Little Gaelic, um, with a little work, you can gain a rudimentary understanding of the Scottish Gaelic language. Now, these lessons were taken from my weekly podcast beginning back on May 15th of 2020. So if you'd like, you can listen to them there as well. But please remember that I am not an authority on the Gaelic language. I just love learning it. I struggle like most all learners. And so what I teach comes right from well-respected Gaelic teachers. I hope you find it interesting, informative, and fun. And as always, I display on the screen what I'm discussing so you can follow along. All right, Kersh Maha, which means, all right then, let's get started. Um, but we're in lesson 19, and it's all about the when. All right, so we're going to start off with, a, we got a bunch of vocabulary in this one, because really it's just a bunch of words you need to learn. All right, we got la, which is day, uh, oichia, night, matin, morning, fesker, afternoon, nok, tonight, and ju, today, and J, yesterday. Error, last night. All right, von J, the day before yesterday. Martin and J, yesterday morning. Fesker and J, yesterday evening or afternoon. Fesker can mean the evening or afternoon. Marduk, tomorrow. And Ath Oichia, tomorrow night. An error, the day after tomorrow. Tra, which is early, and Fadalak, which is late. All right, Jeshel, which is ready. Fada, which is long. Gorich, short. Fad and La, all day long. Fad and F Fad and Esker. All afternoon long. Fad Nahoichia. All night long. Shakten. Week. And Ath Shakten. Next week. All right. Uh, and Shak Sekhai. Which means last week. Or it literally means the week that went. Kolajig. A fortnight which is, a fortnight is actually two weeks. Mias, a month. An Athvias, next month. Avias Sakai, last month. Bliana, a year. An Athvliana, next year. And early, mm, last year. All right. We're going to give you some examples. We're going to give you them in Gaelic and in English, of course. And first one is Ha Fim Akam Er Danzig and Ath Oichia. I need to dance tomorrow night. Ha Shin Afakal Tra An Ath Matin. We are leaving early tomorrow morning. Kachero Ahonyev Anjay. Where was the meeting yesterday? Kovit Lechen of Mias Show. How many days this month? Velu Jeshu. Are you ready? Bimi Fadlak Anok. I will be late tonight. Alrighty. 
Just some examples there. And now we're going to give you six sentences, as always, to translate into English, a little practice. So we'll start off with number one. An savatin hamiadol yan vu. Two, matin an j vami anan bitin. Three, blina ma ur, or blina va ur. Four, hamiadol anan va anambala fadin la. Five, anath yachtin hamiadol yaki. Six, vami agari ti arer hamiak o ti and Jew. Should I? 
Celtic History brings you the tales of the land, castles, warriors, heroes, legends, and customs that have created the rich, vibrant, and sometimes strange and wonderful history of the Celtic world. The Highland Clearances was the forced eviction of inhabitants of the Highlands and Western Isles of Scotland. Beginning in the mid 18th century and continuing intermittently into the mid 19th century, the removals cleared the land of people primarily to allow for the introduction of sheep pastoralism. The Highland clearances resulted in the destruction of the traditional clan society and began a pattern of rural depopulation and emigration from Scotland. By the early 17th century, the people in the lowlands of Scotland which lies southeast of a line drawn from Dumbarton near the head of the Firth of Clyde on the western coast to Stonehaven, were primarily urbanized. They were also more aligned with England in terms of culture, language, and politics than with their fellow Scots of the Highlands. The people in the Highlands, which encompassed the northern half of Scotland, as well as, according to many categorizations, the western offshore islands of the Inner and Outer Hebrides, and Aaron and Butte, were mostly rural and trying to survive in largely infertile land. Their culture and language were predominantly Scots Gaelic. The Highlanders still followed the clan system, which had been in place for hundreds of years. The clans were ruled by one family which its chief was drawn from. The kinsfolk and others who made up the clan lived together in agricultural townships that functioned like collectives or joint tenancy farms. The land was controlled by the chief but leased from him by taxmen, who rented it to tenant farmers who in turn employed cotters to help cultivate it. Tinged with feudal influences, the clan was also very much a martial system grounded on the obligation of its fighting men to provide military service for the chief to whom they owed personal allegiance. Those men were partly dependent on plunder gained from raiding neighboring clans to maintain their standard of living. Now in 1745, Charles Edward, the young pretender called Bonnie Prince Charlie, led the Fifth Jacobite Rebellion that the House of Stuart had undertaken in an attempt to reclaim the British throne. Charles's grandfather, James II, had been deposed as king in the revolution of 1688. Charles won support among the Scottish Highlanders to battle the English and many Scottish Lowlanders for the British crown, and many Scottish Lowlanders for the British crown. After some initial success, Charles and his troops were eventually defeated at the Battle of Culloden, April 16, 1746, during which thousands of Highlanders were killed. In subsequent weeks and months, some 1,000 Highlanders were hunted down and killed. In the process, whole Highland clans were destroyed and were forced to flee. However, even before the catastrophe at Culloden, the clan system had begun slowly deteriorating during the reign of James I, who distrusted the Highlanders so much that he ordered the chiefs away from their clans to attend prolonged court visits so that he could keep them from plotting against him. That deterioration accelerated, however, in the years following the Battle of Culloden. As the British government imposed restrictive laws that compromised the power of the clan chiefs and the Gallic culture that underpinned it. Now, that included the banning of clan tartans, bagpipe music, and the Gallic language. The government also cleared the way for outsiders, lowlanders, and English to acquire much of the land in the highlands. The new landlords were set on replicating capitalist agriculture models employed in the lowlands. The subsequent disruption of traditional life and dispossession of land that occurred over roughly the next century became known as the Highland Clearances. The clearances were generally regarded as having come in a series of waves, whose nature and circumstances varied accordingly to when they happened, where they happened, and who was involved. George Granville Levison Gower, the later Duke of Sutherland, for instance, was the catalyst for notorious evictions that took place from about 1810 to 1820 advised that his interior lands were best suited for sheep raising and were 
weren't really fit for human habitation. He evicted thousands of families, burning their cottages, stealing or killing their stock and establishing large sheep farms. The evicted tenants were resettled in coastal crofts, that is small tenant farms, and frequently own only marginally cultivatable land. They were forced to subsist by collecting and smelting kelp, a source of potash and iodine, something of a boom industry at the beginning of the 19th century, or by fishing, an, an, an occupation which was really foreign to them. Other new landowners in the highlands followed the eviction model that seemed to work so well for Sutherland and others, though some focused on rearing cattle rather than sheep, whereas still others resettled the evicted farmers on crofts where highly labor-intensive cropping was the objective. The decline of the kelp industry, falling cattle prices, and later the potato, the potato famine in the highlands, yes, the same one that decimated Ireland that began in mid-1840s and delivered major blows to the subsistence economy of the crofters. Now, crofters had no legal claim to the land on which they lived. They had been driven off the land that they owned given pennies on the pound for it, and forced to pay expensive rents to the English landlords who cared little for them. When the potato plight hit, about 1846, the crofters were financially devastated. Disease and starvation spread, mass evictions and migrations occurred, mainly to the Scottish lowlands, where factory work could be found, and to Canada, the United States, and Australia. Often, Highlanders departed as indentured servants, hoping one day to own their own land. Now some left on their own. The way of many others was paid for by their landowners who preferred to finance their tenants' emigration rather than you know, provide for them for prolonged years until the economy got better. In 1883, in response to growing sympathy for the plight of the crofters, the Napier Commission was established to investigate their condition. In the meantime, the Highland Land Law Reform Association, better known as the Land League, was established. Finally, in 1886, the possibility of future evictions was legally eliminated with Parliament's passage of the Crofters Holdings Act, which grounded on the so-called three F's, fair rent, free sale, and fixity of tenure. Of course, this came up very short if it was meant as a penance for the treatment of the Highland people during the, the clearances. The clearances did irreparable harm to the Highlanders and their way of life. The Highland peoples experienced defeat in battle, cruel repercussions after the war, genocide, forced evictions, forced migration, famine, and economic despair all within a single generation or two. No wonder it is still a very sensitive subject among the Highland people. And my own, uh, I could, how many times, grand, grandfather, uh, Robert MacDonald, was one of them. And he was forced off his land into a croft, which he didn't stay in very long. And him and his newlywed wife migrated to Northern Ireland in the Donegal area. And then only a couple generations after him did they migrate from there to the Americas. So almost every Scottish American feels the sting of Highland Clearances, whether they know it or not. It's what brought them here, more than likely.
Everyday Celtic Ways brings you the mythology, traditions, and customs that have created a unique and personal culture that still affects those that are Celtic and those that just love the Celtic world. Ohim, the secret code of our ancestors. Ohim, one of the most intriguing mysteries we have inherited from our early Irish ancestors in my opinion, is the lack of historical documentation they left behind. It is generally accepted, nowadays, that theirs was an oral tradition. Histories were handed down through the centuries in the form of story, song, and poetry by bards and druids, with great secrecy. They were recorded not in books, but in brains, shared not by reading, but by mouth. However, Ancient texts were sometimes carved in stone or imprinted on clay tablets. But generally, texts were written on materials that were perishable. They served a purpose at the time and weren't intended to last forever. They decayed with time. Therefore, it is not unreasonable to assume that the lack of evidence means only that they did not survive, rather than they never existed at all. What do you think this says? So it is, I believe, with all of them. 
There are all kinds of conspiracy and intrigue surrounding this ancient art of communicating. Some scholars believe it was designed as a secret code, unintelligible to users of Latin, that is the Christians. Others believe it originated as a set of secret hand signals by the Druids, or that it was developed by the early Christians, the sounds of the primitive Irish language being far too difficult to transcribe into Latin. What do we know? Orhan flourished in the 5th and 6th centuries, although some inscriptions have been dated as far back as the 4th century AD in early medieval times, it was most often used on stone markers, normally indicating property and land boundaries, and graves of the dead. The language used at this time was mostly primitive Irish. Early inscriptions used the edges of the stone as the stem line and were read from the bottom left, across the top of the stone, and down the right-hand edge towards the bottom. The Book of Orhams lists over a hundred variations of Orham which must be learned by all poets, and claims that they were also used to send messages, and for magical purposes, to keep lists, business transactions, and numerical tallies of possessions, and that these were made on wood or metal. Mythology claims Orhan was invented by Ogna Macalathon, one of the Chethadadanan, brother to the Dagda and half-brother to Liu. This would take its creation right back to at least 4,000 years ago. It's not an unreasonable theory to me. It seems perfectly feasible that as long as mankind has existed, they needed some form of communication for the occasions when they couldn't speak directly face to face. Even cavemen found a way to do this, recording what was important in their lives in spectacular paintings on their cave walls. Thousands of years later, we are still able to understand these messages, and appreciate them today. A simple and universal language untouched by the centuries, and all that happened within them. It is claimed in the Orhan tract that not only was Ogma a great warrior and King Naada's champion, but he was a skilled poet and public speaker too, for which he attracted epithets such as Hanimith and God of Eloquence. Apparently, he created the Orhim alphabet when he needed to send a message to Liu warning him of the possible abduction of his wife by the Cid. He sent a birch branch with seven bees inscribed on it, meaning seven times will your wife be abducted into the other world unless protected by the birch. The letter B is therefore said to be named after the birch tree. Note here that the message was inscribed on a branch, a perishable material. However, the Laji Ballerine states that after ten years of study of all the languages of the world, legendary Scythian king Phineas Farsa and seventy-two other scholars amalgamated them to form the Orham script. The twenty-five letters of the alphabet he named after his top twenty-five scholars. Which would kind of make its origins even older. Orham is the alphabet attributed to an ancient form of the Irish language referred to as Primitive Irish which later on in the 6th century was superseded by Old Irish. Beth Lewis 9 is the actual name of that alphabet, derived from the names of its first few letters. It comprises 20 symbols, or letters, each corresponding to the sounds made in that language. Much of what we know about it has been taken from a document called the Book of Bullimoth, which seems to serve as the Irish equivalent of the Rosetta Stone. It documents 150 different versions of the Orhim alphabet which must be learned during the first three years of a bard's training. Each letter is grouped in a series of five, called a family. Each Aikmi is named for its first letter. A fifth group consisting of another five letters, was added at a later date. It is said that the groups are arranged in order of where the sounds are made in the mouth, that is the feather of the first Aikmi would be produced at the front of the mouth and so on to the more guttural sounds made further back in the throat. There is one group of vowels and three groups of consonants. The Orhim alphabet, courtesy of Omniglot, a comprehensive guide to writing systems and languages. Each feather looks like a set of lines crossing, or attached to the right or left side of a central vertical line, called a stem line. Vowels sometimes use dots rather than lines. An inscription on a stone will be read from the bottom left upwards. In a document, the stem line is horizontal, and the characters read from left to right, top to bottom, as you are reading this. Another ancient document, Aura Septna Hases describes the reading process thus, 
Or him is climbed as a tree is climbed, that is treading on the root of the tree first with one's right hand before and one's left hand last. After that, it is across it and against it and through it and around it. Nach Janewicht ist Drucke voll Schauen an, ich hart ist Fahler Es kann schießen und doch trat und leihen Etre mal gesehen Es tut doch hin und dann hier Es kann in an Father, me, me, lie, Foshne, lie, Jin, chin, yer, mana, The top, Faskal, the speech. Ay, Check out my YouTube channel. It's got Celtic music, podcasts, Gaelic language, Gaelic song, Celtic history videos, plus lots more. And my Facebook group where you can give me your inputs and insights on all things Celtic. But before I let you go, the trivia question answers. What meaning does the colors of the Irish flag have? Well, the green represents the Irish Catholics, the orange represents the Irish Protestants, and the white represents the hope for peace between the two communities. But I'm going to let you go with a song.
lovely dairy for fair London time. There is no finer harbour a run can be found where the young stir. But the last time I saw her, it grieved my heart so, for she sailed on Loch Foyland away from Como. If I had the power, the storms fall. It's there.